Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight at our stargazing lecture. Um, uh, hopefully, you guys had an opportunity to look at the cloud chamber out there. And for those of you who didn't, we'll we'll um, we'll we'll have it running for the the entire evening. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a astrophysicist here in the Caltech Astronomy Department, um, and I'll be your MC for this evening's event. So thank you for joining us. Um, just a quick layout of our schedule and and announcements, and then we'll get to the talk. Uh, so after after I have another minute of introduction, uh, we'll have our speaker. That'll go for about 30 minutes, and then we'll take Q&A from the audience, um, not just of our speaker, but we'll have a panel Q&A consisting of Catherine, myself, and a couple of other scientists in the department who work on different research topics. We'll, 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 we'll take questions on all sorts of topics, not just the content but also um, anything that you might be curious about in terms of astronomy or space science or astrophysics, hopefully we can, we can address those questions. Um, simultaneous to the Q&A, we'll also have telescopes set up on the athletic fields just adjacent to this building. Um, there are signs that'll take you out there. So after the presentation, you can, you can stick around for the Q&A. You can go out and look through the telescopes. You can come back after looking through the telescopes. We'll be doing this until about 9.30, 9.45 or so. Um, the telescope should be able to see a bunch of cool targets tonight. So um, you probably saw the moon coming in here, but the moon, Saturn, Jupiter, which was just at opposition a few days ago. So it's, it's pretty large in terms of uh, its proximity to us. And then we'll look at some deep sky objects like um, the Hercules cluster and the ring nebula and some other, the Andromeda galaxy, some other cool stuff. So I encourage you to go out there and check things out, but also stick around here. Um, and obviously you can't be in two places at once, but we'll be doing both simultaneously. Um, we also, as I mentioned, have that cloud chamber that is gonna relate to the content of, of, of Catherine's talk today, um, which is, should be going uh, throughout the duration. Um, other announcements. So we have these once a month on a Friday night. Our next one will be in a month and it'll be just before Halloween. And it'll be talking about uh, direct detection of exoplanets. He's a professor here who studies exoplanets and, and not just detecting them indirectly, but actually taking images um, and, and seeing the light that's coming directly from those, those planets around other stars. So it should be really exciting and really cool. Um, I'll put up the announcements for that in the next few days. Um, similarly, we have a sister series of events called Astronomy on Tap. These take place at a bar in Old Town, Pasadena. Um, it is a family-friendly lo location, so even if you're under the age of 21, you can still go. You just can't, obviously, drink alcohol. But um, we have two 15-minute uh, presentations that are given by different scientists, either from Caltech or JPL or various different astronomical institutions around here. And you can uh, you know, have a drink, listen to a couple of informal talks about science, and then we have astronomy-themed pub trivia. There's live music. There's a telescope there as well. So there's that's super fun, and it's free. Um, and our next one of those is October 17th. Those happens on, happen on Monday nights. Uh, so again, I'll advertise that in the next, the next few days, but those happen once a month as well. I think, I think those are my announcements for right now. Uh, yeah, I will, oh, we're broadcasting this on YouTube. Hello, YouTube and Facebook live viewer. Um, so if, if you want to watch this after the fact, it'll be recorded and it'll be available online. If you're like, oh, I love that one part when she said, go back and watch it. Um, and we have all of these events for the last six years recorded and on YouTube, so you can check it out if you want to see other topics. Anyway, um, our speaker for tonight is Catherine Plant. She is a sixth year PhD student in the department. Um, she did her undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz, which is a, a very high profile astronomical department as well, just up the coast of California. And um, she's been doing some amazing work on a variety of different topics from radio uh, to cosmic rays. And I, I'm really excited to hear what she has to say. And she was the, the person who built the cloud chamber that's available outside. So you can see invisible cosmic rays. So please welcome Catherine Plant. Thank you all for coming. I'm super excited to tell you about cosmic rays and the, the mysteries of where they come from and the puzzles they can help us solve. So cosmic rays are tiny particles that are traveling 
so close to the speed of light that it's really hard to figure out what could make them. And understanding where they come from is one of the biggest mysteries in astrophysics. Now, something is accelerating somewhere in the universe is accelerating the charged particles that form the nuclei of atoms so fast that they've left their electrons behind. That's why it's just the atomic nucleus, but so fast that they're going so close to the speed of light that putting effort into catching and stopping one of those would be as difficult as catching a fast pitch baseball. Now, maybe a baseball doesn't sound astronomical, but the difference between the mass of a proton and the mass of a baseball is the same as the difference between the mass of a baseball and the mass of the earth. So if a baseball pitcher threw the earth as fast as people throw baseballs, then stopping, stopping the earth would be like stopping a baseball going the speed of a cosmic ray. The mystery of cosmic rays goes way back to some of the beginnings of particle physics. In the late 1800s, radioactive elements had been discovered. Radioactivity had been discovered, but it wasn't clear yet what the stuff emitted by radioactive elements was. And people studying radioactivity ended up discovering cosmic rays. Because one of the devices for studying radioactivity was this thing called an electroscope that I've made a little cartoon of. Uh, it was a, an insulating box and a uh, charged piece of metal on the inside. And that metal would hold its charge until it had a chance for the charge to conduct away. The, little, uh, the two little yellow lines are the leaves of the electroscope because like charges repels. So if you put a bunch of charge on this one piece of metal with two leaves, the leaves will repel each other. And then if the charge goes away, the leaves would come back together. And normally, air is an insulator. It doesn't conduct electricity. But if it gets ionized, it can. And so uh, the, the particles emitted by radioactive elements are able to ionize air. And when one of them would go flashing through, the electroscope would, would lose its charge. People noticed that electroscopes kept discharging even when there wasn't any known source of radioactivity around. And then they set out to find out what this mystery radiation was. They thought maybe it was coming from the earth. And so they took the electroscopes up to the tops of tall buildings and that didn't make a difference. They took it up the Eiffel Tower and it was still discharging. And then in, in 1911, Victor Hess went up 17,000 feet in a hot air balloon and notice that the higher he went, the more of this stuff there was. So he concluded that it was cosmic, it was coming from outside the earth. And that's why ever since then it's been called cosmic rays. And cosmic rays have been important in the early history of cosmic, of, have been important in the history of particle physics. I, prior to, building particle accelerators in the 1950s, cosmic rays were the best source of particles to smash into other particles. And smashing particles together is one of the main ways of, of figuring out what all the, the fundamental particles in, that make up matter are. Uh, as an example of a discovery that was made using cosmic rays, uh, here at Caltech in 1932, a group uh, discovered antimatter by noticing that there was a cosmic ray behaving, or a, it's actually the output of a collision of cosmic rays, uh, that behaved just like an electron, except it turned the opposite way in a magnetic field. And now I think I should back up and say, if, if we're talking about individual subatomic particles, how do we, how do we know that, how do we find one individual particle that's speeding by at the speed of light? It's here for barely an instant, it's super, super tiny. How do we find these other than the electroscope? If you want to study, study them in more detail, it's useful if they leave a track behind. And so people have invented some different ways for particles to leave tracks behind. The cloud chamber that maybe you saw on your way in is one of them. 
Another one is uh, certain kinds of photographic emulsions. A cosmic ray would, would leave a track on a photographic plate. And this picture on the left is a, a picture of the photographic plate that uh, the discovery of antimatter happened on. Uh, that track going through is a positron. Uh, and on the right, this is a diagram of the collisions of cosmic rays in the atmosphere. The original cosmic ray particles don't actually make it all the way to the ground, but they smash into the atmosphere, more high speed particles come out, and these were the, this was the radiation that people were, were studying from the ground. Uh, here is a video of a cloud chamber that I'm going to try and play, see if that works. Sorry, it's not uh, letting me fast forward to the, this, that's the dry ice going in. And I was gonna try and fast forward it to where you see the, the cosmic rays itself, but that part's not working. So you'll have to just see our actual uh, cloud chamber in the lobby uh, particles. But the, the, and the reason it works is that cosmic rays are pulling the electrons off of atoms as they, as they fly by off of atoms in air. And these ionized atoms, I uh, give up a, a place for vapor droplets that are right on the edge of condensing. Uh, the ion there is an extra excuse for it to condense. And so uh, the path of a cosmic ray is marked with a, a trail of droplets in the vapor. And you can tell information about the cosmic, what kind of cosmic, what kind of particle it is by whether the track is, is straight or windy or lots of droplets or just a fine stream of droplets. Yeah. And ever since uh, the 1950s, particle accelerators have been a more controlled lab for studying particle collisions than cosmic rays. And this is a modern particle accelerator in the picture. It's a picture of, uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And the Large Hadron Collider can get protons as close to the speed of light as anything that people have ever built. Uh, that's, they go 99.99 with eight nines after the decimal point percent of the speed of light. But the, uh, the, most intense cause or the, the fastest cosmic rays ever detected, if they were protons, would be going 99.9 with 29s after the decimal point of the speed of light. Bringing one of these cosmic rays to a stop would be tens of millions of times harder than stopping a proton and the LHC. So cosmic rays are still a window into particle physics that we can't recreate on Earth, uh, in our own labs. Uh, and you might have noticed I'm using speed and how hard it is to stop a particle as ways to, ways to compare them, ways to compare how close to the speed of light they're going. And I'm talking about it this way because relativistic energy and momentum would be a whole different lecture. So for now, I'm going to stick to the analogy of how hard it is to stop the particle. Uh, here are some modern cosmic ray detectors. Uh, the one called ISS Cream was a detector on the International Space Station. It's above the atmosphere, and so it can detect the original particles before they've, uh, before they've collided with the atmosphere. And the telescope array in Utah, and now you may notice that sometimes people give big projects creative names and, and sometimes they don't. This one is just called Telescope Array <laughs> and uh, it detects cosmic rays from the ground by looking at the effects of the collision with the atmosphere. It covers 300 square miles with a mix of these uh, detector panels that you see in the bottom photo and 
uh, telescopes that you see in the top photo. The telescopes are watching for flashes of light in the atmosphere as the cosmic ray goes through, and the panel detectors are catching some of the, the product particles that do make it all the way to the ground. But where do the cosmic rays come from? That's the really cool question. Uh, the sun accelerates particles to a significant fraction of the speed of light. And uh, this diagram is showing the uh, a cartoon of the solar wind particles uh, streaming along magnetic field lines, interacting with the Earth's magnetic field, because when, when charged particles run into a magnetic field, it, it bends their, their track. And so the Earth's magnetic field actually redirects the particles from the sun, can direct it towards the poles, and uh, that's how we get the aurora. But these particles aren't going anywhere near as fast as the fastest cosmic rays. So most of the most most the fastest cosmic rays have to be coming from outside the solar system, and we need more explanations than the sun. Supernova remnants are one of the candidates. When a star about ten times larger than the sun explodes, or when it when it runs out of fuel, it explodes into supernova, and briefly, this explosion can be brighter than the entire galaxy. Uh, what is left behind from that explosion is the perfect environment for accelerating cosmic rays. It has, it has all the right ingredients. Uh, this is a photo uh, made with the Hubble telescope of the Crab Nebula, which is the remnant of a supernova that exploded in 1054 AD. And it's about uh, 6,500 light years away. Uh, the complicated structure of gas expanding out from the supernova makes a good environment for accelerating cosmic rays. It has a magnetic field and it has lots of shock waves. And now whenever a particle passes across the shock wave, it gets a little boost, kind of like surfing the wave. But you may remember I said magnetic fields can turn charged particles around. So the magnetic fields are constantly turning the charged particles around, sending them back through the wave surfs the wave over and over, and eventually that will get a proton or an atomic nucleus up to cosmic ray speeds. It's thought that about 10% of the energy in a supernova goes into cosmic rays. Uh, and there's even though a supernova in our galaxy maybe only happen once or twice a lifetime, uh, that's enough to provide all of the cosmic rays that, that are observed up to speeds of about 99.99 uh, .99 with, I uh, remember how many nines after the decimal point, uh, with 12 nines after the decimal point of the speed of light. But that's not the, the fastest cosmic ray ever observed. So we still need more sources of cosmic rays. Another idea is neutron stars. These are the, the cores of stars that have exploded. They get left behind at the center of the supernova remnant. They're uh, so dense that they're pure neutrons packed together. And if you could imagine packing the entire mass of a bit more than the mass of the sun, into an area the size of a city. This intense uh, gravitational field uh, is also, it's also a highly magnetized object and it's rotating very fast. And there's observational evidence of streams of, of particles going close to the speed of light, although it's not certain that these are the uh, record setting cosmic rays that we're after. Uh, this is a, a diagram showing a beam of radiation that leaves the magnetic poles, and the blue lines are showing the magnetic field lines of the neutron star. As, uh, as the star spins, it's like a lighthouse sweeping a, a beam in front of us, and we see a flash, and so they're called pulsars. And now the, the movie is several X-ray images taken with the, the Chandra X-ray telescope 
that are uh, taken over, I think, about six months, but then put together like a sped up movie. And it's looking into the, the heart of the supernova remnant that I showed on the, the previous page. You can see rippling waves coming out from the center. And that shows that the, the neutron star at the center of this nebula is, is powering uh, some of the energetic features of, and, and shock waves of the nebula. Uh, but that, that just means it's a candidate for cosmic rays. We still have to keep searching uh, for more, more evidence. And here's more evidence. Uh, when cosmic rays run into matter, one of the things that comes out of the collisions is gamma rays. So looking for things that emit gamma rays is a good way to look for candidate cosmic ray accelerators. Here is an image of uh, two pulsars that are nearby each other on the sky in gamma rays. And uh, it's made with this gamma ray telescope shown here. It may not look like a telescope, but it, it uh, counts up the gamma rays coming from different directions on the sky. And this image, you'll notice it's, it's a color image, but it's actually just a single color image. And the only thing that the color is telling you is, is how many gamma rays come from each direction in the, in the image. So uh, yellow and white means that there's a lot of gamma rays coming from that direction. Red means there's some, but not so many. Blue means not very many at all. And in the bottom, there's a, a picture of the moon drawn to scale to show you how, give you a sense of if, if your eyes could see gamma rays, how much of the sky would be glowing from these two nearby pulsars. This is much, much larger than the Crab Nebula that I showed on the previous page. So that's more evidence that pulsars may have something to do with accelerating cosmic rays, but it's not the only reason that there could be gamma rays. And so there's still, there's still more to explore. It's also a little bit hard to see a way that these pulsars could make the, the very fastest cosmic rays observed. So there are more, more sources we need to look for. Another possibility is that it involves black holes. I, most galaxies have an extremely massive black hole in their center. Uh, the, this picture is of a galaxy that's about a thousand times uh, heavier than the Milky Way, and its black hole in its center is also about a thousand times heavier. And this is actually two pictures laid on top of each other. The background picture, which uh, looks uh, black with some bright spots, is a Hubble image of the galaxy. And the galaxy is a fuzzy blob in the middle. Uh, the purple picture is a radio picture. And you can see the, the radio picture of this galaxy looks totally different than the picture taken with light that we could see with our eyes. Uh, now, I've been talking about gamma rays a little bit. They are on the short wavelength end of the electromagnetic spectrum. All uh, the light we see is just a tiny part of the, the range of wavelengths that light can have. Gamma rays have very, very short wavelengths. Radio waves have much longer wavelengths than what we can see with our eyes. And so this purple picture, the purple is just showing you how, how much radio waves are coming from different parts of the image. It's kind of like the gamma ray picture where there's just uh, a color scale that is almost like a, a color by number where there's more color where, wherever there's more radiation. So the radio image looks totally different from the optical image. And that's because the radio shows us this jet coming out of the, the center of the galaxy. And that's launched by the black hole. Now, you may remember that black holes, or you may have heard that nothing ever escapes a black hole. So how can there be this, this fountain coming out of the black hole? It, it's not actually leaving the black hole itself, but rather as gas falls onto the black hole, falls into it, it starts swirling around in a disk, kind of like water going down the drain. And sometimes as it gets, as it swirls in, it gets very hot and magnetized. And sometimes instead of falling in, some of the gas shoots up from, from the uh, opposite part of the black hole. There's a little cartoon of that here. And uh, galaxies like this are a good candidate for making cosmic rays all the way up to 
the, the very fastest cosmic rays that have been observed. Uh, a nice piece of evidence is that the reason that's glowing in radio is that there are cosmic ray electrons that uh, radiate radio waves whenever they're turning around in a magnetic field. But the fact, just the fact that there are cosmic ray electrons there doesn't mean that there are for sure protons. And so why are cosmic ray sources so hard to pinpoint? Seems like we should be able to just look at, uh, see where they landed and figure out where they came from. But it's because they turn in magnetic fields. And so uh, if this, this red line is a cosmic ray proton leaving some, some source uh, far away. And the galaxy is so full of tangled magnetic fields that the proton takes a windy, circuitous, looping path, and it might land on Earth in a particular direction, but that might not be the direction that it started out in. So we can't make pictures on the sky by counting up where we saw the cosmic rays the way we can with uh, photons and other neutral things. This green line is a, the path a neutrino would take. It would just go right through in a straight line to Earth, and that's why it's really exciting to look for neutrinos. Uh, and the gamma rays are the blue line, uh, they would also go in a straight path, although some of them might get absorbed along the way. And now I've mentioned a couple pretty good candidates for being the origin story of, of cosmic rays, but uh, these uh, jets from supermassive black holes can explain I uh, could maybe explain the very fastest. Supernova remnants could explain most of the cosmic rays in the galaxy, uh, but there's a gap in the middle and a whole, whole range of cosmic rays that, that don't fit in either picture. And so we need another source of cosmic rays. And it, it turns out that the, the Milky Way's field is so tangled up that if, and, and cosmic rays, get through a magnetic field better the faster they go. So cosmic rays below a certain speed, if they came into the Milky Way from outside, they would get so tangled up that they probably wouldn't make it to Earth. So below that speed, we need to look for something in the Milky Way. It has to be close enough that it would be able to get to us because it's a speed where cosmic rays is fast. Even though they're going so close to the speed of light, they just can't get through the magnetic field very well. And and yet, models of supernova remnants don't seem to be able to produce cosmic rays all the way up to that limit. So we're looking for something in our galaxy that can make cosmic rays go even faster than supernova can. Uh, here are just a few of the many ideas for the, the mystery galactic source. Uh, the, Milky Way has a black hole in its center, and it's not making uh, jets like that, that picture of another galaxy I showed. But it turns out that's not the only black hole in the Milky Way. There's, it's the only big, really big black hole, but there's lots of smaller black holes uh, that come from when uh, really massive stars run out of all their fuel. And some of those smaller black holes are, uh, have gas falling onto them from a nearby star. It also works with neutron stars. In this diagram, it's a, a neutron star. But that, that gas makes that disk of sort of like swirling down a water, swirling down a drain. And, and those disks could also launch jets. They would be, it would be mini jets, a much smaller version of the picture I showed a few slides ago. But it's possible that that could make cosmic rays. It's possible that there are more things that, that pulsars do that could end up making making very fast cosmic rays. Uh, and then another idea is large galactic winds. And, and so that is a picture of a galaxy that doesn't, uh, has a, a plume of gas sort of wafting out of it that isn't maybe as dramatic a picture as that jet, but it still can have shock waves. It can be partly caused by cosmic rays and it can maybe cause cosmic rays itself. And so another idea is that the cosmic rays could be accelerated in the, the 
sort of gentle plume of gas wafting out of the galaxy. And I'm really curious what this mystery source of galactic cosmic rays is. And so I'm working on a project to observe more cosmic rays specifically in this, this range of parameters where uh, the existing pictures of where they might come from don't, don't really fit. And uh, I'm studying cosmic rays from the ground. That's because the faster the cosmic rays are going, the more rare they are. And so you need a bigger detector to catch them. Kind of like imagine, imagine catching drops of rain in a bucket. You could, uh, depending on how hard it's raining, if it's raining harder, you'll get a raindrop in the bucket more often. Or if you got a bigger bucket, raindrops would land in the bucket more often. Uh, the cosmic rays going the, the, that I compared to a fast pitch baseball only land in the area of Caltech uh, about once a year at best. And so you need, uh, sorry, didn't. you would need to launch a detector the size of Caltech into space to study those above the atmosphere where you could study them directly. And uh, that is too large to launch into space. So we have to study these cosmic rays from the ground. And that means we're left piecing together the pieces of this, this cascading collision of, of particles, kind of like I, uh, kind of like trying to follow a baseball game when all you can hear is the roar of the, the crowds. Uh, about 200 miles north of here is the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. And the long wavelength array is an array of radio antennas that is being upgraded and I'm going to use it to detect cosmic rays. Uh, in that cascade of particle collisions on the previous slide, one of the many things that comes out of the cascade is radio emission. And so radio antennas are one way that you can tell when an extremely fast cosmic ray has arrived in, in that part of the atmosphere. Uh, but the flash of radio waves only lasts a nanosecond. And so we have to make the measurements on the, uh, on the signals from the antennas very, very fast. It turns out that this makes 140 gigabytes per second of, of data. There's uh, several hundred antennas spread out over, over a few kilometers in the desert. And uh, the total data rate ends up being about 0.1% of the total data rate in the entire internet. Uh, and that's actually, we, we only have about a dozen computers uh, for collecting this data, and that's more data than we can put into the computers. So we have to use special electronics to uh, search the data before it gets stored in a computer. And that's what these little, these signal processing boards are the, the kind of first stage of data processing where I've built a way to look for cosmic rays as they happen and only save the snapshots of data that have, have candidate cosmic rays. Uh, it also turns out that cosmic rays aren't the only thing that makes flashes of radio waves. There's people's cell phones, sparking power lines, uh, welders, various machinery, television stations reflecting off airplanes. Uh, and we end up with thousands or tens of thousands of uh, possible flashes every second when we expect maybe five cosmic rays per day. So it's a huge needle in a haystack problem. And that's another reason that we need these, these very, very fast signal processing boards that uh, I, I have programmed to use those to automatically search for the cosmic rays and only save the data when, when it looks like there's a cosmic ray because we just can't, can't even keep it all in the computers. This is a movie of a cosmic ray arriving from a, a, a previous version of the array before the upgrade. And the spots each represent the position of an antenna. The color and the size of the spot represents uh, how much, how intense the radio waves in that spot are. And you'll see 
the beam of cosmic the beam of radio waves sweep across the array. It starts playing. Oh well. That's too bad. Oh, is it going up? There it goes. And that's the cosmic ray moving across. And that that has been slowed down many, many times compared to how it actually happens. It would actually be be passing across at nearly the speed of light. Uh, and this cartoon gives you a, a picture of what's of what's happening of this beamed radio emission landing on a bunch of antennas on the desert floor. And now I, I wanted to finish with a few ways that cosmic rays touch other, uh, other interesting puzzles. And one of them is river erosion. Uh, rocks that are exposed to the air get residual amounts of, of radiation from cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere. And that gives them more of a certain isotope of beryllium and certain other nucleotides compared to rocks that are covered up with something. And that makes this byproduct of cosmic rays into a tool for mapping out the history of rocks being eroded by rivers. You can tell how long they were covered up and then uncovered. And so cosmic rays have become a, a geology tool. Another cool thing that people have done with cosmic rays recently is using them to search for empty chambers in uh, or sealed off chambers in pyramids. Uh, it works kind of like uh, getting an x-ray at the doctor. The x-ray of, a, of say, a, a hand or an arm works by shining x-rays through your arm. And where, they're, where you are denser, not so many of the x-rays get through. And so counting how many, where the x-rays land on the other side gives a, a sort of a density map of, of a person. But if you want to do that to map out the inside of a pyramid without damaging the pyramid, uh, you would need an enormous x-ray machine. And that's just not possible. So we use, people use natural radiation and the cosmic rays work for that. They put cosmic ray detectors uh, under the different parts of the bottom of the pyramid. And that was used to show that this uh, biggest pyramid in the middle had a chamber that nobody knew about. And finally, cosmic rays might even touch on a, a puzzle in biology. Uh, all of the strands of DNA are uh, helix-shaped spirals, but they all spiral the same direction. You could imagine a mirror image DNA that spirals the other direction. Uh, a lot of molecules in biology have two, two different versions that are mirror images, and, and yet biology, actual life forms, always use one and not the other. It's been a big mystery how that got picked. How did life pick which of the two mirror images to be? Recently, people have proposed that cosmic rays might be involved because the cosmic ray muons would very slightly preferentially knock electrons off of DNA that curves one way compared to DNA that curves the other way. And even though it's a small difference, it could add up to uh, a different mutation rate over a long enough amount of time that life could evolve to always use the one handedness and not the other. And now that's, that's an idea that was recently proposed. When they proposed it, they also proposed some experiments to test it. And those experiments are, are still underway. Uh, but I wanted to include some of the, the latest ideas that are still being tested. Uh, and so in conclusion, cosmic rays are still a mystery. Uh, they're useful for some other puzzles here on Earth. They've had a long history of, of solving various other puzzles, but we still don't know what makes all of them. And I'm really excited for some experiments that are upcoming in the next few years that are going to add more pieces to the puzzle. And thank you for coming.
Okay. Um, so excellent presentation. Thank you, Catherine. What we're going to do right now is uh, transition to a group Q and A where you can ask questions of both Catherine as well as a couple other members um, of the department. So that'll start in about five minutes. We'll set up a table. Um, at the same time, we have telescopes set up outside. Those will be going for the next 45 minutes or so. We will be doing this for the next hour or so. So you can go back and forth. You can check out the telescopes. You can come back in for the Q&A, stick around for the Q&A, go out for the telescopes. Whatever you want to do, there is a cloud chamber that Catherine built. Um, just outside in the with the ambient uh, medium there. So, so feel free to check that out. We'll get started with the Q&A in about five minutes, just as soon as we get the table set up here. Thanks, everybody. Should I take this mic off? Should I take the mic off? Yeah. Go ahead. yeah.
Amen. Thank you to those of you. Thank you to those of you who stuck around. Um, I'm sure more people will be back. I realized that was kind of anticlimactic. I should have taken questions right then. Sorry, Catherine. Um, but we still have our viewers online as well. Sorry, I'm just gesticulating towards this phantom camera here. Um, okay, so we just saw this wonderful presentation from Catherine. Uh, do you want to sit here, Dylan? So people are generally familiar with Kath, do you still want to give some intro on what you work on, or do you think it was at some level? Okay, we'll just, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Um, we'll just have each of the members of the panel give a, a short intro to who they are and what sort of science they work on, and then we'll open it up to you guys and, 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 and try and address all of us, but also specifically the content of the presentation that Catherine was talking about. Um, I'm Cameron Hummels. I'm a, a research staff here working on computational galaxy evolution. I try and study how galaxies like our own Milky Way form and evolve over long periods of time by modeling them virtually inside of a computer and see the interactions that they have with other galaxies and with gas and with dark matter and those sorts of things. Uh, Keeching. Hello, I'm Keeching. I am a graduate student here in planetary science. I study comets and asteroids, things in the solar system that uh, show activity whether it's gas, dust, or uh, anything else that makes them uh, behave unusually. Um, yeah, I just talked a lot about my research, but I, I'm a sixth year grad student here in astronomy, uh, working on building a cosmic ray detector for the owen Sally Long Wavelength Array, and also interested in other ways to uh, study places that might be forming cosmic rays. Um, I'm Dylan. Uh, I'm also a grad student here, and I study explosions of various types, mostly exploding stars, but sometimes jets being launched from black holes, like Catherine was mentioning, and all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Um, so now we can take questions from the audience, and we also have an online audience that we can take questions from. I'm not entirely sure what the question is, but I was very curious, when, Captain, when you talked about the speeds of these various cosmic rays. And so could you just talk a little bit about, first of all, how are we able to measure with such precision to this degree of decimal points something that is so close to the speed of light where the difference between 12 nines and 20 nines, you know, 
it, it, seems, it seems like it'll be, it, it, that is a very, very, very small fraction of 186,000 miles per second. So how do they, how do they measure that? And then second, if the, this may be a dumb question, but if the Large Hadron Collider can accelerate a proton to 99.89s, the speed of light, why can't it go all the way to a hundred percent? Both really good questions. I uh, when when something is moving, it has it has momentum and and also kinetic energy. I uh, and the when something is going close to the speed of light, the faster it goes, the more effort you have to put into making it go even faster. So to make these measurements of how fast it's going, we we aren't actually measuring the speed directly. What we're measuring is things like energy and momentum. I uh, because that in my, uh, it might be look like a small difference of 0.9 versus 0.999, the speed of light, but that can be a difference of tens of millions in uh, momentum and energy of the particle. Uh, did that answer both of your questions or? Oh, oh and then how, why we can't, yeah. Yeah, so the the closer the closer you get to that limit, the harder it is to speed it up even more. And so you'd need an infinite amount of energy to go all the way. Yeah, that was great. No, but it's good for the online. Oh, I see. Um what what's the the magnetic field in that uh the uh, the cloud chamber like approximate intensity of the magnetic field uh well no oh wait, but you put some magnets in there i did but, but I yeah don't so know. the in the cloud chamber that's outside i threw in a couple of small neodymium like powerful fridge magnets um but as far as i can tell they're not having any impact on the i, I just threw it in there to see if they'd cause some curvature in the paths of things and i didn't see any change so i think the main thing that's affecting the curvature is just the ambient earth's magnetic field which is what half a gauss so i yeah i hesitated to answer because i wasn't actually sure what cameron threw in there <laughs> questions or i can ask something from online um so i missed part of your presentation so i think this is related uh richard mahorter asks how do the ice cube measurements enter into the big picture um, is there any overlap with the Owens Valley work that you were discussing? Uh, okay, so so Ice Cube and en enters the the picture because Ice Cube is looking for neutrinos, and neutrinos would be produced by certain uh, certain particle interactions that cosmic rays would make with with matter that they pass through, and the uh, the gamma ray gamma so. Cosmic rays interacting with matter would produce gamma rays and maybe also, also neutrinos. But the gamma rays can be produced by a lot of different ways. And uh, neutrinos could be uh, signals that are harder to come up with an explanation other than cosmic rays. But they travel in straight lines. So they would be traveling in a straight line from the source of the cosmic rays all the way to Earth. And so uh, observing neutrinos could be a really good way to to actually nail down where cosmic rays are coming from. Uh, and the work at, at Owens Valley is, uh, I didn't have a chance to go into uh, too many more details, but what we're focusing on is in this uh, range of energies that's at the extreme limit of what the galaxy can produce, we want to make better measurements of uh, what fraction of cosmic rays are different elements because looking for uh, sudden changes from heavy elements to light elements could help I could help uh, add to the picture of what different sources might need to be out there. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience. 
Um, you show the slide of the detector on the ISS and then on the ground. Could they like work in together where like the detector where it begins and then the ground can, can the ground detector can like get that information and then knows where they're coming from from, from there? Or that's a that's a really good question, but I, I think the the cosmic rays that are detected by the space detector would would interact in the detector and then uh, not have enough energy to also be detected from the ground. The ground-based ones are detecting really high energy cosmic rays that are too rare to find in small uh, satellite experiments, uh, but are uh, able to make a lot of particle collisions in the atmosphere such that they're able to be observed from the ground. Uh, there's an additional question from uh, the online audience, and that is, when you were discussing the extremely fast, you know, highly energetic cosmic rays, is it possible that merging neutron stars or merging black holes are one of the the origin scenarios that could produce these sorts of super high energy cosmic rays? Uh, so merging black holes probably wouldn't be unless they did some, unless they had a lot of matter around them and did something complicated to that matter. And that's because if you just have the black holes by themselves, uh, there, there aren't any uh, protons to accelerate because anything that's in the black hole can't get out. Uh, neutron stars, maybe. I haven't heard a, a lot about that as a, a source of high energy cosmic rays, but I think it's, I think it is in the, in the running somewhere. It's not one of, yeah, not one of the top scenarios, but it, it wouldn't probably wouldn't explain uh, the ones that we're after in the galaxy. Yeah, uh, Vera. Oh, sorry. Additional question. It's a three-part question, but the first two are really short. Do you know what, how fast the slowest cosmic rays might be? Like what percent of the speed of light? Oh, that's a that's a good question. How how slow can it go and you would still call it a cosmic ray? Mm -hmm. I think uh solar energetic particles are kind of uh right on that line where sometimes sometimes the particles from the sun that are going uh a appreciable fraction of the speed of light, but it's not ninety nine point many nines percent. Uh, sometimes those do get cos called cosmic rays, and sometimes they just get called solar energetic particles, uh, even though they're that, the, the same thing. They're kind of on the edge of calling them a cosmic ray or not. Okay, cool. Thanks. So do you think cosmic rays could ever be created in a lab or a collider? Uh, well, then they're not cosmic because they're, oh. like, they're, not, they're not coming from outside the Earth, but uh, mm -hmm. the protons that the LHC accelerates are going uh, plenty fast to consider them that we, if they came from outside the Earth, we would call them cosmic rays. So do those particles that you have on Earth tell you anything interesting about cosmic rays? Uh, yeah, they tell you how the, how the collisions will go in the atmosphere, because uh, if all you can do is kind of pick up the the pieces at the the bottom of the atmosphere and you want to know about the original cosmic ray at the top of the atmosphere you need to know how those collisions proceeded and there's some extrapolating that you have to do because it's happening at a higher energy than than what the lhc operates at uh but studying collisions in detail in a lab is important for understanding uh what will come out of how the shower of particle collisions will happen in the atmosphere so that we can watch a shower and know something about the original particle. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, there are a couple other questions online. Uh, Robert Baker asks, do cosmic rays emit radio waves? And can you measure the coincidence of the radio waves and the cosmic ray shower to learn something about it? Uh, yeah, so that, that's basically what my experiment is doing and that the the cosmic ray shower itself is is what's emitting the radio waves uh cosmic rays do also emit radio waves especially if they're uh very light and able to turn easily which is mainly the cosmic ray electrons and so most of the galaxy glows with radio waves from cosmic ray electrons uh but 
that is not, uh, it's a, it's helpful, but not super useful in figuring out where the high, or where the extremely high energy protons are coming from. Okay. Um, there was an additional question that was, do cosmic rays consist of all sorts of particles? Can neutrons be part of the package? Uh, yes. Neutrons can be part of the package. They probably, uh, it, it would be hard to accelerate a neutron all by itself. And they also, a neutron all by itself is unstable and will decay. But uh, you could accelerate an atomic nucleus that has protons and neutrons, and then maybe and you accelerate it to cosmic ray speeds, it could crash into something and a neutron could uh, fall off and be by itself for a while until it decays. And uh, it's actually something that we've thought about trying to do with the detector that I'm working on is maybe search for uh, clustered events on the, if we saw a cluster of events on the sky at roughly, uh, that were roughly the same mass as protons, uh, they, that could indicate that we have a very nearby neutron source because it would, it would need to be close enough that the neutron can get here without decaying. But since neutrons are neutral, they'll go in straight lines. Uh, yeah, but that's that's an idea of something we want to test. Hasn't been We haven't tested it yet. We don't know if we'll see that. Additional questions? Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the engaging talk earlier. Um, you talked about this experiment with um, the pyramid um, so that we can use the cosmic rays and we can uh, deduce uh, where the uh, secret chambers within the pyramid is um, by the cosmic, cosmic rays that go through um, and reach the detector. But um, since aside from the ne neutron contributions, these are charged particles that have their paths um, bent um, by external electromagnetic fields. I'm curious as to how um, unless the environment is completely controlled, completely absent of electromagnetic fields, how the information from cosmic rays can be used to show the exact locations and the spacing of these empty chambers within the pyramid. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And the specific particles that they're looking for are uh, muons, which uh, are one of the products coming out of the cosmic ray shower and they have the right mass and energy to, uh, e even though they would eventually turn in Earth's magnetic field, they're uh, starting out in the atmosphere, which is already pretty close to us, and uh, going close enough to a straight enough line that that this works. Other questions from the audience, and uh, keep in mind, there are two other members of the panel that you can ask yeah. questions of as well. I mean, obviously, Catherine is the star of the show, given her uh, awesome presentation on cosmic rays. But um, uh, Qi Cheng works on 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 uh, planets, uh, and Dylan works on a whole host of different things. But uh, I mean, everybody works on different things and knows different stuff. But Dylan works a lot on transient um, supernovae and and um, and explosions in space. So. I work on galaxies, but I always talk, so I don't have to talk. Yeah. Hey, what's the um, what's the flux rate of cosmic rays, and how does it change over time? Like, how many orders of magnitude can it a pulse occur if it occurs? I uh, it's most modulated by uh, where we are in the solar wind because the solar system's magnetic field directs how cosmic rays rely or, or arrive on Earth. Uh, at the very highest speed cosmic rays, the ones that are able to get through magnetic fields better and are able to go uh, a lot straighter through the solar system, I wouldn't expect their... Uh, flux to vary so much, but the slower cosmic rays do vary uh, as the as the Earth moves through the solar wind. But the uh, Voyager probes exiting the hemosphere and being um, 
beyond the influence of the solar wind, but still uh, detecting cosmic rays from outside the solar system. Do you know, is there anything that, I mean, I know the instruments that are on there can only detect so much, but is there anything that we've been able to tell from that data since they've left the heliosphere that tells us anything about cosmic rays that we didn't already know, anything different about cosmic rays beyond the solar system as opposed to the ones we detect here in the solar system? Uh, yeah, it, uh, so they're able to study the uh, very slow waves in the in the ISM and kind of, uh, I'm not a not an expert on Voyager, but I uh, yeah they're they're detecting particles on the other side of the uh, boundary between the solar system and the interstellar medium, and uh, so now Voyager is detecting particles that haven't had to make it into the solar system and is able to uh, map out how plasma in the interstellar medium behaves. Uh, there's a question from the online audience. Chris Georgie asks, uh, do cosmic ray collisions cause direct transmutation of elements where you actually change like, you know, helium into carbon or carbon into nitrogen when they slam into to each other? Uh, well, it, uh, yes, I think it would because I, uh, even though that a cosmic ray proton may just interact with one proton in a in an atom, that that would change the nature of the atom, and I think that's part of how the river erosion study works. Yeah, yeah, I know we see that same sort of effect on the surface of the moon that doesn't isn't protected by a magnetic field. It gets slammed by like solar wind particles, which it's the same sort of thing. Charged particles traveling at really high rate slam into this and can cause cause that sort of effect. Um, question is, oh yeah, feel free to duck out and go check out the telescopes or do whatever you need to do. Um, question online, it's been shown that comets can emit gamma rays. Has this mechanism be been determined how they do that? Okay. Maybe not cosmic rays. Do you have any idea on this, Keychang? Uh, I don't actually. Yeah, I've never heard of gamma rays coming from comets. Yeah, I'm not sure I have either. I know there are X-ray observations of comets that have been done. I'm not sure the mechanism behind that is well determined either. I would assume it has something to do with, uh, could be from solar effects and uh, the, the uh, uh, magnetic fields that it can induce on the comet. So comets, uh, they don't intrinsically have magnetic fields, but the fact that they're in the solar wind and they have, uh, they emit uh, ionic gases that sort of twist those magnetic fields around in strange ways. Uh, those can do funky things. Interesting. Um, other questions from the live audience? I can just keep going from YouTube and see what people ask. But if there are questions here, you guys, you guys get precedence. You're here after all. Oh, question for Dylan. Uh, my favorite kind of explosion. Well, it's got to be the uh, the kind that I discovered. Um, so you might. So. Uh, in 2014, there was a flash of X-rays that was discovered by the MAXI instrument on the International Space Station. And in 2017, I found this radio afterglow that came, was coming from the same location. And so, in um, about a year later, we found uh, this uh, hydrogen emission line that was coming from the same location as well. And so, piecing together the clues, uh, we figured out that the only thing that would be able to produce the specific radio, optical, and X-ray signatures that we saw in conjunction would, would be the merger of uh, a black hole or a neutron star and a massive star. So basically, the, the compact object got swallowed whole by the massive star. And that compact object 
eventually settled its way into the core of the star and blew the star up. And that's an explosion that I discovered. I mean, it's it's got a very boring name. <laughs> uh, I mean, names sort of uh, of like types of phenomena get settled over time. This one doesn't really have a settled name yet. Uh, I, I like the name merger driven explosion, but uh, the, the people call it different things. There's like common envelope jets supernova is another name that has been appeared in the literature. You, you said the black hole or neutron star got swallowed up. But a very compact object got swallowed up by a massive star. Why, why, you know, I would think it would be the other way around that the black star, the black hole would swallow up the less dense, new, you know, less gravitational, less gravitationally potent neutron star or massive star. How does that happen? Yeah, I guess uh, in the same way that you know, is the Earth orbiting the Sun or is uh, the Sun orbiting the Earth? Right, gravity is pulling in both ways. Right. So if you imagine the scales of things, massive stars are absolutely huge, so like the size of the solar system, whereas a black hole or a neutron star is, you know, the size of a city or smaller, right? So you're uh, you're throwing a really tiny thing, and that tiny thing is just incredibly destructive. And eventually uh, what they're doing is they're orbiting their, their common centers of mass, but the orbit is decaying because the black hole or a neutron star is interacting with the gas that's inside the star. And so it's just spiraling in and in and in towards the core until it reaches the middle. Uh, a question on the line, Robert Baker asks, can cosmic rays be used to map the inner structure of the moon or asteroids or comets in the same way that you were describing uh, it being used to map like the interior of the, the pyramid sort of thing? Uh, so the moon, the moon would be too big because you, uh, this worked for the pyramid because some of the cosmic rays got through and they wouldn't get through the moon. And then an asteroid maybe would be the right size, but you'd need to be able to put, uh, muon detectors all around it. And so you'd need to get to the asteroid and that would be the hard part. So they wouldn't get through the moon because it's too large and the path length of the cosmic rays is too short relative to the size of the moon? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there, there are some interesting things that could happen if you observe the edge of the moon and very high energy particles might uh, collide, collide with the moon and then have a, a shower of particle collisions come out of the side of the moon. And you could, you could sort of use the moon as a cosmic ray detector that way, but that relies on knowing the structure of the moon instead of what I think the question was, was whether you could map the structure of the moon with it. Um, how are elements with higher masses than helium fused from core collapse super, supernova? And why does the process stop at iron? I guess we can all answer that. Question. Yeah, core sure, collapse yeah. supernova. Um, so basically, when a star is first born, it's mostly made out of hydrogen. And hydrogen is the first thing that burns because it requires the lowest temperature to burn. So it basically lives for most of its life, like more than 90% of its life, burning hydrogen. And there's all this waste product of helium that settles into the core. It's just there. And it's not ignited because the temperature isn't high enough. But eventually, the star runs out of hydrogen to burn. Uh, not entirely, but in the core. And so it starts to collapse a little bit. And the collapse superheats the core, and the temperature skyrockets up to the point where it can build hel or when it, where it can burn helium. And the helium starts to burn, and that stops the collapse of the core. And the star bounces back and settles into another equilibrium. And so helium starts to burn, but eventually helium runs out as well. And then the next element, which I forget, maybe somebody else remembers, uh, starts to burn as well. And uh, carbon to nitrogen to oxygen. That's right. Yeah, the the CNO cycle, the the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. Um, and uh, eventually, you have the same process. You you burn an element, you run out of it, and then the core starts to collapse more, 
until you can burn the next element until it's hot enough. But eventually you start building all this waste product of iron in the middle. And what's different about iron is that burning iron doesn't actually give you more energy out. It actually sucks energy in to burn that iron. So some of the iron does burn, but uh, you don't get this release of energy that allows the star to settle back into its equilibrium state. Instead, the star just continues to collapse and it collapses until the point where either a neutron star or a black hole is formed in the core of the star. And then it bounces back and it explodes as a supernova. That's how most, uh, at least one type of supernova is created. Great. Oh, questions. Yeah, so why does it bounce back? So that's actually something that is not entirely settled, but we have some idea for why it does bounce back. So let's say that there's a neutron star uh, that's formed. Then physically, the neutron star is so dense, it can't be compacted further except into a black hole. And so physically, you have some of it just literally bouncing off the surface of the neutron star. Another important mechanism is that when you're forming the neutron star, you actually release tons of neutrinos, which are a particle that was mentioned earlier. And normally neutrinos are just able to pass right through anything, but the cores of stars are so dense that actually neutrinos will not pass through. They will actually impart their momentum. They'll, they'll push the stuff outwards and they'll uh, give it some outwards momentum. And so that's another mechanism that we think causes it to bounce back. And finally, uh, in some cases, you can even launch jets. This is very rare. This is like one in 10,000 supernovae or so. But um, in supernovae that form black holes at their centers, uh, you can have material falling into the black hole that forms a disk within the center. And it can launch a jet just like the supermassive black holes that Catherine showed in her talk. And those jets can also drive out material from the star. and uh, help the star explode. Isn't there also degeneracy pressure from like the neutron star itself or the electron itself can, you yeah, can get this yeah. quantum effect where you get a bunch of particles that are close together and they don't like being close together. And so they intentionally kind of repel each other when they get dense enough called uh, like degeneracy pressure from enough electrons or neutrons that get really close together. Yeah, yeah, that's the reason why you can't compact a neutron star any more than it already is. Exactly. And things are just bouncing off instead of squeezing the neutron star into something smaller. Other questions? Okay, cool. We've got more online, but... Um, we're getting a lot of information with, like, the James Webb Telescope. Are you guys using any of those information for your, for your study or anything? Or are you using any of the James Webb information? Right. Oh, yeah. Who's using James Webb for their science? Not yet. Not really. I'm not. I will be at some point, but what about you guys? Uh, lo lots of people in this building are, but I, I'm not. Uh, I am about to graduate. I was going to write a, a James Webb proposal, but I didn't have the time. But the next cycle, I will be putting in one. Uh, there's another kind of explosion that I discovered recently, which is one of these uh, rapidly spinning pulsars that Catherine also talked about in our talk. Uh, Pulsars, when they uh, when they spin, their magnetic fields uh, rotate really quickly, and that causes a large voltage. And that voltage launch launches a wind that's traveling at nearly the speed of light. And that inflates a bubble. Uh, and one of these bubbles exists within the Crab Nebula that Catherine also showed. Uh, and so this is the Pulsar Wind Nebula. So I found one of these, except instead of being in the Milky Way, like pretty much every other pulsar wind nebula we know, this one's actually uh, 300, 400 million, mi uh, million light years away. Uh, and so hopefully I I'm going to use the James Webb Space, Space Telescope to see if there is an infrared counterpart to the radio pulsar wind nebula that I found. Uh, it's not clear that it'll be there, but if it is, then it'll be pretty spectacular. And... Uh, it's going to teach us a lot about the actual particles, which you could actually consider cosmic rays potentially, uh, that are being launched from within uh, the pulsar wind nebula. Yeah, so I don't have anything currently planned uh, at the moment for the web, 
telescope. Part of the reason is most of the things I study are uh, not very predictable in nature, as in you don't know when the target is actually going to appear. And for example, we don't actually know when the next bright comet's going to appear. These things come out from the uh, depths of the outer solar system where no telescope that we have, like even Webb, can detect them, even if we knew where they are were. And so we have to wait for these things to be discovered as they approach the sun. As they get closer, they get increasingly brighter. Then we have to wait for these the surveys that uh, are constantly monitoring the sky in all directions for one of them to detect it. And only at that point do we find, uh, well, we first have to figure out, is it going to be interesting or not? And uh, if it is at that point, depending on how far out it is. I mean, a lot of these things, if they show up, like say a week before they get destroyed and disappear, that's not really enough time to put in a proposal. Uh, you send in the proposal, they take a week to review it at best. And then by the time they get around to it and scheduling it on telescope, it's gone. And so, yeah, there's a very select number of uh, comets uh, well, I shouldn't say that there's a lot of comets that are observable with Webb. They just tend to be the ones that uh, stick around. They don't really come all that close to Earth. And the ones I study are the ones that uh, tend to approach the sun really closely. And uh, those tend to get extremely bright. They can uh, have do things like fragment into many, many pieces. And uh, those are pretty rare. And if one were to pass through the inner solar system and it were in the correct part of the sky so that Webb could actually observe it and there were enough time in between the discovery and the finding of it being interesting and it's still being observable some time later, that's when I might consider putting in a proposal. Oh, yeah, uh, Brian. Thanks. So the, um, James Webb Space Telescope um, mention of that reminds me of a question that I had earlier this week. I was, I was watching an episode of Nova. It's actually from about a year ago, but about the Big Bang. And they mentioned a, um, uh, a spacecraft uh, that I think the European Space Agency launched that's at the L2 point. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm blanking on the name. I think it started with a D, acronym Deirdre or something. But anyway, the question was, the Webb telescope is also at the L2 point. So can you sort of, how big is the well of gravity that forms the L2 point and how are they able to safely situate it to the extent, you know, how are they safely situate various spacecraft? That's not what, what's the word I'm looking for. Uh, but so that they don't interfere with one another, obviously web, one of the biggest concerns about web and why we put it there was to keep it free from, you know, infrared energy from earth and from, you know, so how, can you explain that? Sure. Keycheng, do you want to talk about this since you work on solar systems? Uh, yeah, sure. So anything you hear that is being placed at one of the Lagrangian points, including L2, they're not literally sitting at like that specific point. They are very often, well, actually, in every case, they're put into a sort of orbit around that point called a halo orbit. And instead of just sitting fixed, it very, very slowly moves in sort of this not quite circular, but or elliptical or but this weird, this interesting looking figure, sort of round figure around this the L2 point. And that is a very it's a very large orbit. Uh seem to recall the uh, the size of the orbit, I think, is comparable to the distance from here to the L2 point. So if you have a spacecraft sitting at in one of these orbits, 
and you were to go up to that spacecraft, you probably can't see any of the other spacecraft that are also orbiting L2. And the same applies with L1 or any of the others. Yeah, so my question is about the degeneracy pressures. Say a neutron star gets held up by the degeneracy pressure and the neutrons are, you know, the nu nucleons basically are, are stable. But it does break eventually because if you put more stuff on it, it'll become a black hole. So what breaks? I mean, it's almost like an egg which eventually cracks, right? So what is it that cracks and the degeneracy doesn't hold anymore? I can talk about this unless one of you guys wants to. Um, so effectively what's happening, uh, let's see, how deep do we want to go on this? So for a white dwarf or a neutron star, a white dwarf is just held up by electron degeneracy pressure and a neutron star is held up by neutron degeneracy pressure. Although it might, it's probably more complicated for neutron stars. We don't know their full equation of state. There's probably some weird stuff going on in there that we haven't yet probed. Um, but Essentially, what you're dealing with is what's called the Pauli exclusion principle or the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that you can't know the position of a particle as well as its momentum simultaneously to infinite precision. So if you hold, if you grab a particle and you constrain it and you know that it's right in this one spot, then you have a huge amount of uncertainty in its momentum or its velocity. And similarly, if you know its velocity really well, then you don't know its position very well. And, and when you have this, the, these particles that are crammed together, uh, gravitationally held together, like in a white dwarf or a neutron star, you're constraining their position really, really well. And so you have a huge amount of uncertainty in their velocity. And once you cram too much in there, it jacks up the velocity so high that the velocity starts to exceed, the, the velocity required there exceeds the speed of light. And, and so once you, once you exceed that, then bad things happen. Then essentially gravity, gravity wins and it collapses because you can't exceed that velocity. Um, so it's effectively like, you know, the first person to figure this out was, with, was Chandrasekhar with white dwarves and the Chandrasekhar mass was the maximum mass that a white dwarf could be. And it's this weird cornerstone uh, between quantum mechanics, this Pauli exclusion principle and, and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, as well as relativity kind of jamming up against each other. And, and, and at some point you can't beat this speed of light. And so it just collapses under its own weight. But that's kind of, I think that answers your question, like how it's, why it's cracking the way it is. A black hole is even denser, right? So the uncertainty in the position is even smaller. So what does it say about the velocity inside? Maybe I should. Then when you go when you go into the singularity of a black hole, then then all bets are off. Then then the quantum nature kind of breaks down. Um, I mean, I don't know. We don't really know what's happening in a singularity. I'm not a relativist. I'm not a GR person. But but um, and perhaps one of these fine members can respond a little bit better. But once everything goes into the singularity of a black hole, the quantum effects seem to seem to go away at least at that level. Or at least we don't understand how they operate. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add that you don't actually have to be in the singularity. You just have to be beyond the event horizon of the black hole. And then whatever can happen inside a black hole, that's fine, because we'll never be able to get any information out of it. And so uh, physics can't break if we don't know about it. <laughs> at least that's, that's the, <laughs> you know, you can, you can hide anything inside of a black hole. Can you have a what? A quark degeneracy pressure? I mean, you have electron degeneracy pressure, and then you have the neutron degeneracy pressure. Why not a quark degeneracy pressure? If you have that, then the, will the density be enough for a black hole, basically, to trap light? Does anybody know? I... I know I've... I know that I've seen fairy papers about quark stars, but I it's it's not my field so i don't know what the conclusions are yeah. yeah so i think it's a property of all particles that have uh spins uh with that are 
halves in that go in halves. So electrons, these things are called fermions, and electrons are a form of are a type of fermion that have a uh, spin of one half. And it comes out of if you were to do the math and uh, put it into the wave equation and try to model the probability distribution of uh, where an electron might be. And you have two of them, you find that the probability essentially goes to zero if you try to push them together too much. And that's with any particle that has spin one half or three halves or, and so on. Particles with uh, spin zero and one and two uh, those are called bosons, and those do not have degeneracy pressure. And so you can essentially push them together and they'll occupy the same space just fine. Things like photons. Great. Um, there's a question. Wait, do you guys want to add to that? Catherine, do you want to add to that at all? Oh, I was just clarifying, clarifying quarks are fermions. Okay. So they would have degeneracy pressure. Degeneracy pressure. Um, so switching gears, there's a question from Calvin Sung online about the DART mission that maybe you guys saw online uh, on NASA TV, where we, you know, NASA successfully slammed a refrigerator sized object into an asteroid, not because there was any, you know, not because the asteroid did anything to us, but uh, because the asteroid, it was a test of planetary defense in case. An asteroid at some point in the future is headed towards us. We want to know what it would take to actually move one of these things out of the way uh, so it doesn't run into the Earth and cause mayhem. So the question is about the DART mission um, and how it looks like grains of sand and rocks right before impact are on the surface. Uh, what do you think the odds are that Dimorphos, the asteroid that was struck, has been pulverized by the impact? Because the size of it was what, like 100 meters or so, like a foot, 150 meters, like a football field of the actual asteroid that was struck. And then, oh, thank you, Dylan. And then uh, the, uh, the impactor was like the size of a person or so, right? Is that right? Uh, yeah. It's very small compared to the asteroid. I think a few, maybe 10 meters across. Yeah. But th that's in the long dimension. Uh, so yeah, this, the spacecraft is not a very big spacecraft. Uh, I think it's in total, it's, I want to say around 500 or so kilograms in size in mass. And most of that, uh, most of its size, dimensional size is in, because it has very long solar panels sticking out of its side. And those do not have very much uh, mass. And so because of that, uh, there's essentially no chance that uh, Dimorphos will be destroyed. Like, it, it's a very small spacecraft that's absolutely tiny compared to this huge, I mean, it's not a huge asteroid. It's, fairly, it's a fairly small asteroid, but it's huge compared to the spacecraft that we're uh, launching at it. And so I think... Uh, based on the based on the uh, papers that the mission team has published on what they think th or what they thought the uh, impactors what the spacecraft should do to the asteroid, they estimate let's say it they estimate that it'll move the asteroids change its speed by something on the order of a millimeter per second or so. And so the asteroid will, in a sense, it'll feel the fact that, You've got the spacecraft coming in at six kilometers per second hitting it. And in that it'll slightly move, which is sort of the purpose of the test is to see exactly how much it will move. And that work is currently still ongoing with the with the observation teams. But the amount of movement that is expected is very, very small. And uh, yeah, so. I mean, the asteroids should be fine. There's there's probably a big crater on it or something, but other than that, yeah, don't feel bad for the asteroid. Don't feel bad for the asteroid.
the you know trail going off, but we didn't really see that the object was still there. Uh, right. Sort of like the smoke going off, and presumably the other pathway there. Yeah. So the question is, is we should be able to see, shouldn't we be able to see if the, the impacted asteroid is still present from the, the CubeSat images that came after? I haven't seen the CubeSat images. I didn't think they were released. I thought the only things that were released were from the Atlas telescope in Hawaii that was monitoring it. And it shows this like debris trail that goes like sloughing off from, from it. That's like this dust cone, but they were okay. Oh, all right. Did you guys see them? Well, everyone looked at it. Everyone who's looking at it. I just don't, I haven't seen the released data. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen them yet. So, yeah. So, in terms of uh, Leech Cube images, at least, uh, they, that spacecraft at least can't directly confirm positively that the asteroid's still there because it's obscured by all the dust that is coming out. And so if, in fact, if you were to look at the uh, system right now through a telescope, uh, in fact, I actually did this on Monday morning or Tuesday morning, right after the impact and went out to see the, see the, the asteroid itself. It actually looks like something like four times brighter than it did before the impact. And this is the total combined system of uh, Didymos, which is the main asteroid, something like 700, 800 meters in size, plus D Dimorphos, which is the smaller 100 something meter asteroid that uh, DART actually impacted. And because of all the dust that got thrown out and ejected out into the system, like there's just so much dust that the dust is way brighter than like the two asteroids combined. And a uh, leech a cube, I mean, it, it was flying through the system at basically the same speed as dark, just like six kilometers per second. So it doesn't get to stick around and look to see what the system looks like after all the uh, dust is cleared out. And so it could only see the system with all the dust in it. And we could see there's a lot of dust where Dimorphos was and probably still should still be. But the dust is just way brighter than the asteroid itself that we can't actually make it out as a distinct object just because there's too much dust. I had the same reaction, but I didn't know if there was a higher resolution version of that image or if you were looking at the image. Well, image you can see Didymos. I mean, it does, it, that's not obscured by the dust. Well, of course, that wasn't impacted, but so I just thought maybe if there's a, you know, I just looked at the picture on, you know, NewYorkTimes.com or whatever. I figured if there's a more high resolution version, maybe you could see it, but you're saying you can't. So, yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that, uh, Leech cube is like a cube sat with a not, I mean, it's, for its size, it's a very good camera, but like there's only so much you can stuff into a cube sat. And so I'm, I'm not sure its camera at any point, even during the closest approach, could even actually resolve uh, dimorphos. Like, even if there were not dust, I'm not entirely sure about that, but. Like looking at the uh, images that have been released, at least uh, they're they're not of the re same resolution that you saw with Dart, at because Dart is a full spacecraft and has a full its Draco camera is a full telescope uh, that can that is uh, can image uh, things with very high resolution something that leech cube can't do and so i think if it's possible that even without all the dust uh dimorphos would just essentially look like a dot 
And if you surround that dot with <laughs> essentially big, lots of white haze from all the dust, that's way brighter than that dot, then that's essentially what we end up with. Um, question from the audience. Um, what was one big discovery that was very important to you that you were a part of that you kind of, I guess, are proud of, if that makes sense? Yes. What was a, a discovery that was important to you that you were part of? Yeah, Cameron, do you want to start? No, <laughs> you, have, you have a good discovery. I'll have to think about what I've d discovered. Okay, I, I've talked about uh, two of the discoveries I've made already. Um, I don't think you were here for them. Um, but uh, I think more generally, one thing that I'm proud of is that I found lots of explosions that are happening on the radio. So before... Uh, the survey that I work on, the VLA Sky Survey, came online. We only knew about like a few tens to maybe a hundred of these radio explosions in the sky, but uh, with the VLA Sky Survey, we're now finding thousands. And so, with these thousands, we're finding all sorts of new types of explosions. And uh, two of the ones that I talked about were uh, one of them is a black hole or a neutron star that collided with a massive star and caused the star to blow up. And the other one is not really an explosion, but it's uh, this pulsar and wind nebula, this spinning neutron star that's launching a, a huge wind that was initially obscured because it was hidden behind the guts of the star that blew up, that formed the pulsar. Uh, but eventually the guts of the star uh, expand out to the point where it becomes transparent and you can see the nebula from within. So it looks like an explosion, even though it happened centuries ago or decades ago in this case. Hi. So I'm, I'm working on building a part of a radio telescope. And I, I guess what I'm most proud of is how, uh, yeah, how the instrument is coming together. And it's been uh, several years of, of building it. And uh, probably later this year, we'll be able to start the search for cosmic rays. So uh, that's not a, a discovery yet, but I'm excited about uh, getting to to build some different parts of that instrument. Got something I probably can't talk about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually have something that I think could be very interesting, except it hasn't gone through peer review yet, and it hasn't really been publicly announced that it can't. So, it, yeah, maybe in a couple months, if you ask that again, I'll say it. Uh, but in, in lieu of that, uh, something else that's sort of interesting that I've worked on. So one thing that I've kind of just been very interested in is uh, figuring out how comets will brighten into the future. That's something that it sounds like it should be simple. Like you have you have a piece of ice and rock. We know how ice and rock behave when you heat them up, and so in theory, if we, we should be able to predict how the comets brighten over time. And if we find a new comet, we should be able to say exactly how bright it's going to get there five months from now. Except if you look at the track record of the people who have tried to do that, it has not been very good. Uh, there have been a number of comets that have uh, Sort of been typed up as being like the comet of the century. Like, like for years before. And then, uh, 
I've sort of been looking at the topic of the kind of look that there is certain file process. They spent their entire lifetimes, the entire lifetime of the solar system, four and a half billion years, essentially out in, in the Oort cloud, and they visit the inner solar system for the first time. And these comets, for whatever reason, they tend to behave somewhat. Uh, they tend to brighten in differently from comets that have been close to the sun before. And so one thing I have been involved with is to try to characterize the properties of their dust. And so when a comet's in the outer solar system and we see it start to brighten, that's because it's releasing a lot of dust. And we're observing not the nucleus, the solid part of it, but all the dust that it's ejecting, kind of like the ejecta that uh, DART produced from uh, dimorphos. All that dust is way brighter than the nucleus itself. And the question is, what exactly is that dust? And it seems a lot of these uh, first-time visitors, a lot of that dust is not actually dust, but actually water ice that is just looks like dust to us uh, from Earth. Uh, and because water ice in the outer solar system, it's too cold for water ice to uh, turn into gas. And so it essentially behaves very similar to dust, except for the fact that once the comet moves in closer to, that, to the sun, all that water ice suddenly vaporizes and is no longer there. And so one potential explanation that it's actually still in the works is that these comets are so unpredictable because we're trying to extrapolate their brightness from all the water ice that's it, that's making them bright when that water ice actually won't be here for us to see once it gets close enough to the sun to be bright. And so, yeah, that will be, yeah, so that's something that's, Active, I'm actively involved in that I think is pretty interesting. Um, one question over here. What is a recent um, thing that's been discovered? It doesn't have to be done. It doesn't have to be done by you. Uh, that just piques your interest. A recent discovery that you find interesting. Thanks for coming, guys. I, uh, I'm really interested in the gamma ray maps that are that are being made of uh, different objects, like that that pulsar that I showed. I, uh, people are seeing more gamma ray clues of where interesting high energy processes could be. And that's really interesting to me. Yeah, so I personally think that the fact that, well, I guess the interesting thing is uh, that I'm thinking of is 
the inter first interstellar object that was discovered back in 2017, Oumuamua. Uh, I find it interesting mostly because uh, there really hasn't been a good solid explanation for the behaviors that it has exhibited. There are lots of explanations that can explain parts of its behavior and lots of explanations that are just plain wrong. Uh, but there really haven't been like any explanation for how it is behaving the way it does. And the paper papers are still coming out on a regular basis, trying to create build physical models to be able to simultaneously explain things like how it's able to uh, yes, move in the way it did without being without it's the mechanism for that movement being detected. And, uh, I, and thought also the, I thought it was being addressed. I thought I thought there was a theory that did. I thought it was a, a like a nitrogen block, and so we wouldn't be able to see the emission lines from the nitrogen, but we'd, it would provide the jets. Or yes, maybe uh, you're you're the specialist on this, so I'm just yeah. So that that explanation has problems from multiple angles. I think okay, one of which being that. Uh, nitrogen even though you can't see nitrogen gas itself we have detected n2 diatomic nitrogen from comets because nitrogen doesn't stay stable in space under solar radiation uh, when certain uv photons hit it it can split apart or get ionized and actually even though n2 is not visible N2 plus is visible and very bright. And comets have, we have seen N2 plus in comets. And we would have been able to see N2 plus in spectra of this object. The other problem with that explanation is that it requires, it has some statistical improbability to it it basically requires us to have caught this piece of ice nitrogen ice right before it would have been like completely vaporized by the sun and so i think the model that paper came out uh with it says something like like 90 percent of the mass of or 95 percent of the mass of this iceberg would have had to have been vaporized by the sun lost and it was just very just barely got extremely lucky and the tiny the last bit of tiny last tiny bit of ice just barely survived the passage right very close to the sun to be observable by us and I mean, in theory, that's possible, but like, what are the odds that the first one of these objects that we see is something where 95% of it was destroyed? I mean, more likely than not, it would have either been destroyed or completely vaporized, or it would have been mostly there. Like, it's very improbable that it just barely got saved like it barely escaped the sun for us to observe. So yeah, that would be at least my take on that theory. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's also problematic. I don't, yeah. Uh, like even if we were to entertain the idea that it would be like it doesn't make any sense for someone to engineer a spacecraft to do with that what Oumuamua was behaving like like it doesn't make sense to build this spacecraft that goes around tumbling and 
has this is like super red colored like if they want it to be like a white sail or whatever it should be like reflective and not like super red colored and if it's tumbling it kind of doesn't work all that well as a light sail anyway so yeah lots of problems okay oh i'm gonna blow out the speaker system uh thanks everybody we've reached the end of our night thanks for sticking around and asking questions and listening to to what we have to say and hopefully it made some sense what we were all talking about or or whatnot um we our next event is astronomy on tap october 17th um in old town pasadena uh one talk will be on supernovae i don't know what the other is the explosions outside there's a bunch of fireworks going on i don't know why i guess it's the first week of classes and people are because dylan likes explosions yeah um and our next one of these i don't know it'll be i think october 30th it's the friday it's the last friday of this month and it'll be on direct imaging of exoplanets, planets around other stars, um, by Professor Dimitri Mawe. So uh, stay tuned. Thanks for sticking around. Thank you, audience online, for, for sticking with us. And uh, we'll see you guys next month.